journeying that went along with that to hopefully illustrate and bring together um, the things that we have heard from the community yesterday about are you listening? Are you willing to listen to what we've heard this morning uh, about the need to really make yourself um, vulnerable, ready to position yourself so that um, the reader as well as the community knows who you are when you enter that space. So this comes from the premise of what we have been talking about um, for the last day and a half, which is this idea that in a traditional way of thinking about research, we are trained right, to be objective, where we go in with a purpose. Um, we are the expert, right? And this is where we start talking about listening and self-reflexivity to reverse this idea about who really is an expert in that space. Is it me because I am trained? Or is it the community who have been living the things that we are going to be talking about? Um, and then, you know, this idea about how we in that process, and this is something that I also struggle with, you know, being in a, a place where you know um, that you have to do certain things to be able to get rewarded or awarded, right, to move ahead. But at the same time, knowing that when I do that, I am actually speaking for the community. I am representing the community um, through that um, work that is really my voice that is being heard, even though I say it's a representation of the community. And so it's great to kind of follow up with the discussion that um, Amber and Mohan were having about um, as CC as a methodology, how do we um, connect those spaces? How do we challenge those spaces? How do we move forward um, in a way that we do not only speak about it, but we actually do what we speak about? Okay. So the premise, and what I hope to illustrate through, through the project and through this presentation is that how we as a researcher can become part of that uh, process. And that really is two things that I'm going to highlight, which is the idea of listening and um, self-reflexivity. Now, we've been hearing about this for the last uh, the, you know, day and a half. But what I'm going to do is really talk about, for me, what that means and how I use it for my research. What are the things that I pay attention to when I say listening? Okay. The first idea is that there is this notion of equality, that I am not the expert. And it has to begin in the moment when I decide I'm going to do research, that I, yes, I have decided. And I have to acknowledge the fact that I decided I'm going to do the research. Yet, right, when you enter that space, there is still that openness of collaboration that says we are equals. I am, not, I am also a student. I'm also a learner, as you know, um, Collins mentioned and demonstrated earlier when he was talking about going in and asking. Right? I, I'm here to learn. You t tell me what is it that I need to know in order to then perhaps figure out how we can come together to help, to move forward. Okay, um, right, so the, idea, the other idea that I accept, right, is that everything is authentic, but when I go to listen to the stories, I only get part of the story. I am never going to get the whole story because I am not part of that community. Right, so today when I talk about my reflections, I will talk about how, you know, I am of the same culture. I'm studying the same culture. I am, you know, also faced with similar things, but yet I will never be a part of that community in a way to understand their life in a complete way. So I have to accept whatever they tell me at that moment as the truth, as the authentic part it is. The next person who goes in, goes in might get a different version. That does not mean right, that I don't, I didn't get the truth that it was not real, what was um, shared with me. Right, so <clears throat> um, in my paper, you know, I begin um, with, with this idea that listening means the ability to suspend your agenda, your judgment, and become the non-expert, the student. This means that sometimes when I go in right, with a set of questions, we don't talk about those questions. I become a counselor. Sometimes I just become a person who hears stories that has nothing to do with what the study right, was designed or was for. Uh, but in a way, it still tells me a lot about the women. 
in a, um, in a qualitative method sense or in a, if you're teaching a method class and you tell your students you need to go out and do 20 interviews. Now, they go out with a guide and say, well, did you complete your interviews? Right? I, I asked my student this, but then I would ask myself, did I complete the interview and was it successful? Yes. But did I ask any of the questions that I wanted to? No. It has nothing to do with my agenda, but everything to do with what the participants have to tell me. So this idea is, it comes from the fact that we begin with this notion of self-positioning. And um, right, it, this idea is that it attunes me from the beginning as to who I am and what I'm about to do. So um, you know, I share with you right, my position at, when I was entering this space. Right? I come from the same culture as the women, yet I do not. We share language, religion, food, and tradition, but I'm not part of a marginalized group. I begin with locating myself in a culture that has given me affordances in life. I begin with acknowledging that my privilege colors my understanding of the context of the women's lives at the margins. My privileges limits my understanding of hardship, pain, struggle um, in life. Our narratives of gender identities reflect two different worlds that we experience as women, but of the same culture. And so I am aware from the moment that I am creating that space for the participants um, to be who they are and to share that knowledge with me. The second part to this is coming with the, with the leading to that is the idea of self-reflexivity, right? And academically, we would define it as uh, the researcher becomes part of the research. Um, it's a self-reflection. But what does that mean? Right? How does it really work out in terms of doing your own research? So I share with you one of my self-reflection um, and, and the <clears throat> first day that I was about to go and do the interviews with the women. And this is what I had written in my journal. Um, as I ready myself to meet the women, I am fully aware of, of myself. Uh, this goes back to the point that was being made about who are you outside of what you do? Right? Do you have your identity? Do you realize that? Um, and do you acknowledge that as you are about to um, enter that space? I know I am not same, nor do I want to pretend that we are same, even though we share cultural similarities. To me, this is about respect, and respect is about acknowledging our differences. I know even if visually I look like the woman, as soon as I speak, it will be obvious that I am not. The way I speak will indicate to the women of my privileged background. I dress like I just so I decide to dress like I normally do. Um, so you know, when I'm home, I'm from Nepal, so when I'm home, um, as a married woman, there are certain rituals and certain things that you have to fulfill. But, you know, and the choices of the clothings are, is a constant mindful effort to be who I am regardless of who is in that setting. So if I was going to go see my elders, if I went to see my parents, if I was going to the community, it still represents me. I do not change or pretend or dress down or up in a way that reflects the community, but really a mindful, conscious way of entering that space that I go in as me. Um, from the beginning without pretending to be a friend, when in fact it's obvious that that's a relationship that you build over time. So I decide, I dress I like I normally do, right? My um, jeans, jeans, kurti, the tikas and the bangles and the beads and the, um, you know, that indicates that I am, um, I am married, but it also indicates that I'm clearly from a modern, educated family because of the way that um, I am dressed. Uh, this is really how I would be in any other instances as well. The second part to reflexivity, reflexivity is this part that you have to be, you know, it's every part of the research. From the moment that you decide to do research, I think it goes back to your question earlier about, you know, we, after the data has been collected and you go, aha, right now we are in a collaborating, now we have to do reflexivity. And the whole idea is that you have to, the moment that I choose that space, the moment I decide that I realize and accept what my position is um, in, that, in that. So this is the first day I went um, before the interviews even began. Right? At 8.30, um, I close the car door behind me as I hurry across the crowded city street. As I make my way, I think about the stark differences in the lives of the women I'm about to meet and myself. I'm not sure what to expect when I, when I actually meet the women. I feel anxious as I walk through the narrow alleyway. I walk hurriedly to a, hurriedly to a two-floor house tucked away from the main road. It bears no signage. I am greeted by a staff at the door. She knows who I am. 
an upper strata of social class educated a professor living in Singapore, and such uses language of formality and respect. I too, in turn, use the same language. Looking around, I immediately know that I am also different from the staff who work here. I am also aware that everyone at the center is watching my every move. I quietly follow the staff to the director's office. She is not in, but I am asked to wait. I am offered tea, which I graciously accept. An hour goes in another. Neither the director nor the participants arrive. I am unsure what to do, but I wait. While I wait, I try to soak myself in my surrounding by observing and listening. At some point, the staff came in and apologized for my waiting. I smile and assured her that I'm fine to wait and is not inconveniencing me in any way. And I ask her in turn if it's okay to sit here and, and wait. I think of the irony. I should apologize for occupying their space and time. Around noon, she pops her head in and asks me if I would like to order lunch. I ask her what the staff normally does, whether I can join in. I meet the staff who eagerly ask me questions about me. Um, I hardly get any questions in about the organization about, or about my potential participants. After lunch, I go back to, after lunch, I make myself comfortable back in the room and wait. The director arrives, it's 2 p.m. and I started my day at 8.30 a.m. that morning. We chat about the study. She calls in her staff and asks her to arrange someone to take me to set up the to their VCD clinic, which is about 15 kilometers outside of the main city, to begin my field work. And I'll show you a little bit about the, the next day. <clears throat> the drive takes me outside of the uh, Kathmandu city limits. As I watch out the window through the morning drive, I can't recall the last time I was here. The car stops on the shoulder of a busy main road. From the window, I see the staff from yesterday waiting for me by the road. I get out and greet her. I follow her across the rice fields towards a two-floor house, well hidden from the streets. I navigate across a small, muddy, made-up made pathway. My eyes are fixed on the house as I follow her. We arrive and she proceeds to introduce me to the center staff. I greet everyone in the same formal language as yesterday, and like yesterday, I am very aware of the differences in me and everybody around me. I am, however, certain that yesterday's interaction has already been relayed to the clinical staff. So from the moment I walked in and I sat down and I became part of that, <clears throat> had already I had been communicated because the way I was greeted and introduced and welcomed into that had already set the tone by my six hours of sitting in the, in the staff room and having. Would, would now, on a traditional methodological sense, if you are teaching qualitative research or anything, you say, well, the, they didn't do anything that day. But um, in, in the sense of really the true spirit of self-reflexivity and really creating a space for conversation and listening, that I had already begun that process on that day. So um, I have five minutes, she says, so I'm going to skip through to the, to the part about um, a little bit about the gender identity part and how the inter how the reflections intertwine and how um, you know my writing and so you know who I am and how that sets up the, the setting. But what happens when you actually conduct interviews and I have to come back and write uh, write a narrative? So the two ideas is that there's a difference in our personal lives and that there's a difference in our social lives because these are women who are commercial sex workers. So they are in that area, in that field, or working as they call pesa or occupation is because. Are uh, they um, in a, a different vulnerable situation in their lives, but most primarily because they're try they are trying to survive and trying to support their own children. Um, so the way that in, they end up in that situation as well as the social relations, meaning how I am treated as a woman of the same culture because of my profession as versus the women who also consider themselves to be in a profession and not just defined in a, in a mainstream traditional way. So this is just an ex excerpt of the idea that runs through in terms of how they become um, sex workers and why they stay in that. Right? I started this line of work because my husband was abusive. He took my citizenship and wouldn't give it to me. So in Nepal, your citizenship is tied to either your husband or your um, father. So if he has control of that, you have no form of identity or having to be able to, um, to find work. And so he wouldn't give it to me because of land inheritance or inheritance for my children. 
Uh, because she's married, and usually when you're married, you move into your husband's family, and you take up his name and his identity, you do not, she can't not go back to her family because she's already married. Um, and this is true of many, uh, most of the women that I was talking to. Um, to get a, per a permanent job, I need that, right? She's doing this to take care of, of um, her children. So I share my own position with you um, in relation to the, to the women, right? Um, <clears throat> I know I'm, uh, I'm part of a patriarchal society, but I never question how that gets performed because I have never had to confront a situation where that has limited me in becoming who I am. In fact, I was raised in a family where equality is assumed between boys and girls, men and women. I perhaps do not question this as much as I should. I have become complicit in furthering this gender inequality. This equa equality continues in my life. I am well educated. I have not taken on my husband's name, though we live with his family. Um, I, he is a stay-at-home dad and, I, and the caregiver of the family. We have re reversed the traditional norms around gender roles. I am even more removed from how patriarchy is performed in the lives of the women. Um, I have never claimed to challenge, although I have never claimed to challenge patriarchy, though we operate outside of traditional gender expectations, uh, us as in and, and the two of us. In fact, what I have come to realize through this process is that I can challenge and live out those reverse roles because I'm privileged to do so. Uh, it allow, that privilege allows me to reverse those roles and think about that in a different way. Um, so similar to in the social relations, so, so in social relations they talk about how they get treated outside um, of the family um, and uh, by police, by um, community members, by society. So they're talking about um, that relation, relationship. So I, I just want to get to the, the conclusion to keep with, with time. And the point of this whole discussion and the whole process here is, is twofold, right? That positioning myself, right, it also highlights to you my biases. Right, what I'm coming in with, because obviously, you know, I can say, well, I'm from Nepal, I, I understand the culture, I speak the language, so therefore I should be well equipped to be able to um, write a, a story in a cultural um, sense, right? But it's still, even in that space, I am very removed. Right? So the whole idea is that that process becomes intertwined. Um, that by positioning myself in relation to the women, you, you actually then start to get the whole story, right? Their story in relation to mine, because if I stay as an objective um, you know, re researcher, then I would come back and tell you my interpretations. Uh, but their interpretation is very different than how I would make my interpretations, because ultimately, right, I'm going to make that interpretation from the position I'm sitting in, not from their position. And which comes down to the practical sense of what we're doing, right? Because ultimately, the whole idea of theorizing and doing all of this is that we can move forward and have a pragmatic sense of what to do with that. How do we really um, make an impact? How do we really invest ourselves in social change? And, and really, I think this is the key, which is that the interpretation, the solution that I would propose from my position of privilege and interpretation is going to be very, very different than what the women really would want and to start from the position where you acknowledge that really it's, I'm not the expert. I, I, don't, I, know what I, I know what I think the women need, but the women know themselves what they need in their lives. And, and maybe it has nothing to do with um, what, I, um, you know, what I envision for them. So I will end Presentation is by Ricky Giola. Oh, okay. And a quarter by Pamela Custodio. And the topic is self reflexivity in development communication research and auto ethnography. Okay. Good morning. I'm uh, Rika Limenzola. I'm from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. 
uh, the College of Development Communication. And I'll be presenting our paper about self-reflexivity in the research and also ethnography. Uh, I've been thinking about this moment for, <laughs> for a lot of sleepless nights, think of, thinking about this moment because I'm really a bit nervous um, about being vulnerable, about sharing this very uncomfortable uh, journey of mine through my research. So, um, so let me start about uh, an overview of what I will talk about uh, this morning. So, uh, I hope to achieve theoretical understanding in DevCom by uh, reevaluating the role of dialogue as an embodiment of participation in DevCom practice and placing reflexivity in DevCom theory and practice, and explore, exploring critical studies as a potential tradition in DevCom research. Uh, the auto-ethnographic the auto accounting was done by the first author, and the analysis and tentative conclusions were derived through a dialogic encounters uh, between authors, invoking a mentor-mentee mentor -mentee relationship and a conversation between people. Uh, let me share to you this uh, whole story made up of little stories in between. And this paper was an unforeseen journey for me as a development communicator and a development practitioner. And this was just uh, a fab five minute conversation I had with my co-author and it thought about this paper. So uh, let me tell you about the context of this uh, this inquiry, it first started two years ago when I was conducting my undergraduate research. So this was the start of my inquiry. So my first research uh, journey was, I was another, uh, I was a, a researcher from another province, entering a community of IPs in another province. So I'm from Los Baños, there, the center. And uh, I went to Oriental Mindoro. Uh, it's, uh, an hour away by sea travel and uh, three hours three hours away from the okay uh, and uh, a three hour uh, travel from uh, Calapan which is the capital uh, I attempted to surface an indigenous presence in the public sphere of mining discourse this community is a community in tradition, uh, in, uh, in, trans, uh, in transition. Uh, they are uh, already practicing the lowlands way or the Tagalog's way of living. They are already dressed in shorts, in shirts, and uh, they have a lot of practices uh, that's already with the lowlands. And I will tell you why that part is very important. And uh, I used the Habermasian public sphere as my theoretical lens. <laughs> and it assumes that its presence com is communicatively constructed in the participation in the mining discourse. So this is a retelling of a research journey. And I went back, uh, I went back in, in my mind. Uh, I reflected on uh, this particular journey and it, it led me here. Okay, so I consider myself a survivor of the story they, or we, are living. And uh, today I reminisce my research moments with them, however worried that I might be a victor retelling history. Okay, so let me share to you this first uh, anecdote. Uh, this was, uh, I had a uh, question asked from a competition in the University of the Philippines, Diliman. And this head of the panel asked me when I presented the, my paper on the first journey, my first research journey, she asked me, development communication is very beautiful, especially how you presented it. I saw the importance. However, aren't you afraid that DevCom will be a homogenizing agent? I smiled as I remembered my conversation with my research buddy on the bus ride home from our first fieldwork. Back to the moment I realized we were never going to save the world. Okay, so I am here to uh, share with you the same uncomfortable musing that I have been reflecting on this paper. That we, as researchers, as development workers, as academicians, are not gods. As experts of development, if I may lab label it as such, have we taken a step back to question our authority, 
our sincerity. Okay, so uh, let me give you a brief overview on development communication. Uh, from a simple economic uh, utopia as the basis of development in the 1950s, it became a complex play of multiple factors and yardsticks that constitutes development. And the failed promises of modernization caused shifts in the paradigms of development. And it has continuously evolved to an integrated participatory development for an inclusive, long-term, sustainable development and other considerations in between. And because of this paradigm shift, shift DEFCOM also evolved through the years. Uh, DEFCOM is a, uh, a convergence of two key concepts, which is development and communication. Development being the more important concept, uh, communication being the vehicle toward uh, to forward development progress, uh, which is... Uh, said by Nora Kebral, uh, the recognized uh, mother of development communication. Uh, DEFCOM uh, research finds it be its beginnings in cybernetics and social psychological communication traditions, analyzing systems, behavioral correlation, and measuring knowledge and attitudes and practices. So let me uh, share to you the, mo uh, the current uh, the current definition of development communication and it has been the foundation of my uh, uh, it, it has been the uh, foundation of my study from the first research journey until now and it has been the foundation of my musings so reflexivity and reflexive methodology okay so uh, Alvison S. Kohlberg uh, said that there are two basic characteristics uh, in reflexive research. Uh, careful interpretation and reflection. And reflection is a very personal experience. No one can reflect for you. And the sites uh, for instances is in where reflection is, is uh, enacted. Okay, so continuous reflection to protect the danger in privileging one's own voice one's own voice, the precondition of any objectivity of all scientific knowledge of the body. And, okay, and also ethnography. So, I would like to focus on vulnerability. This has been a very difficult journey for me uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, res uh, reflecting upon it. And when I shared it to my uh, co-author, it was a difficult journey as well because uh, acknowledging your vulnerability, uh, acknowledging your humanity is a very painful process. Okay. And in, in order to feel trust, uh, in order we need to feel trust to be vulnerable. And we need to be vulnerable in order to trust. And some, uh, author ethnography is the embodiment of the human intertextuality of existence. Because someone had the courage to be vulnerable, vulnerable first with themselves and eventually others. So uh, let me gloss over my methodology. So I created my old recordings, journal entries, field notes, and presentation and discussion notes. And I had an iterative process of reflecting and discussing it with my co-author. And the most painful of all, writing. <laughs> So here is my findings. So let me tell you this story about Cap uh, Malakas. Cap uh, Malakas is the tribal uh, barangay captain in the area, and we asked for his permission to go into the field, uh, live with them, interview them, have conversations with them. And he is very meek. Uh, his voice is often unintelligible, and he's very shy. But when you ask him, uh, he's not afraid to speak his mind. Uh, this, I was talking to him. Uh, this is his house, by the way. Uh, we were talking outside about mining, and I was helping him recollect this meeting with the mining companies when they, uh, the, the mining companies were trying to get in and exploit the environment. And when I was interviewing him, uh, this, there was this moment that he asked me if those questions are really part of my study. And I said yes, and I was very uh, 
taken aback about his comment. And he told me, every time, uh, every time mining is mentioned, we become afraid whenever we hear it. And he attached this, uh, this fear that I might be associated with them and I might be invading their space. So as I re reflected upon this, uh, this interview, I realized, did he disclose himself to me? Uh, did I invade his space that much that uh, he didn't give everything? He didn't share his all with me. Uh, this one, uh, the story of Leader Pala. He is a cooperative leader uh, of the farmers. Uh, I met him when we were introduced around the community. He is very cordial, he's very uh, uh, welcoming, and we went to his house. Uh, and he really, he warmly uh, had us there, he offered us water, and we were chatting him like we weren't other. We weren't, uh, okay, five minutes left. <laughs> okay, so, uh, this, uh, I was taken aback by his, uh, he was a leader, but he was uh, not very open about sharing his own uh, views in the community. He lets the authority to speak for them. And this one, uh, he told me that uh, I should come back to the community. And when I was uh, hearing this on my recording, uh, guilt overcomes me because it's almost two years. I haven't been back ever since. And it made me think about uh, what... Uh, uh, how, how should I approach this as a development practitioner? And the last is Makahiya. Okay. Uh, Makahiya is a Barangay Nutrition Scholar and he and she was the last of our participants to, to have our conversations with. Uh, she is very shy and she uh, she's not really that sharing with us. And I found her resistance in our uh, conversations with her. Uh, she frequently frustrated me as a researcher because uh, I cannot get uh, something out of it. But when uh, the time when I, I was uh, talking to my research buddy about this, uh, this instance, uh, we, we realized that her shyness might not be uh, about her personality per se but it was her silence that was resisting our invasion. So, uh, let me skip okay, to... So, the place of reflexivity in DEFCOM research. Because we have been claiming that we are the voice of the voiceless and we are speaking on their behalf. But have we questioned uh, who are we to speak on their behalf? And claiming authority on a on a particular inquiry can lead to a danger of forgetting our situa situatedness in the inquiry. And I realized the innate uh, Messiah complex can be a double-edged sword. That even with our sincerity, we could place a lot of authority in our, uh, in our um, recommendations as what they really need. But have we asked, what do you need? And okay, uh, this question was asked when I presented uh, the, my first research journey with uh, my uh, co-authors class. And there's this question, how did you help them? And uh, it took me a while to answer it because I was aiming for a theoretical understanding. And there was no direct uh, help that I made in studying this particular inquiry. And uh, I would like to end this uh, presentation with this uh, with the question with the answer to the question on the first anecdote, uh, the challenge of homogeneity in DEFCOM. So, uh, because of this research, I learned to be reflective, to not always take things as it is, but to look deeper and ask uncomfortable questions. Maybe what we insist they need is what is is not what is really necessary for them. The only guard to homogeneity that can be perpetuated by DEFCOM is continuous critical reflection on the dangers of its self-deception.
uh, for this question will always be a reminder. As a development communicator, have I forgotten where I am situated? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ricky. And uh, to continue asking tough questions, the final presentation by Elaine and Eric Kramer, all the way from the University of Oklahoma. Uh, the title is Trapped by the Mother's Gaze Homeless and Humanity uh, in America. before I start the presentation. Uh, we have slightly changed the topic of our paper, and, and for some reason, I, um, the conference schedule stated that I'm the first author, but in reality, I really feel that, uh, well, in reality, it's not about how I feel. <laughs> My husband is the first author, and I'm the second author on this issue. The reason how this project started is most of you who know me would know that I study how people from different cultures communicate with one another in healthcare settings. Uh, but I teach all kinds of health health classes, including public health communication. And that's by far my favorite class. And I got, uh, usually I have students uh, participate, develop a community-based communi uh, health campaign at the end of every semester. Um, Throughout the process, uh, the homeless shelter at Norman, Oklahoma became very receptive to our health campaign. And so in fall 2014, um, I decided to have this class that we, the whole class will focus on homelessness as a healthcare issue. And I plan to use homelessness as an entryway to allow my students to see the different theories of how social support, um, structural injustice could apply to a particular group and impact their quality of care. The class started with every student developed the group into six groups. They did their um, literature review that present on specific health concerns or issues homeless people would face. And when I first started this project, I really think like a teacher. I wanted them to sort of have an applied way to imagine the theories they learned. But throughout this course project, it changed my mind about um, what I'm doing, actually. We talk about social change projects so far, and lots of people believe that that's what, they, what we do. In this course, I ended up telling my students that this is a social change project, but what I see that that I'm most likely to change is not the problem of homelessness. You know, we're never gonna save the world. However, I do think that there's a change that I see fundamentally in my students, how they start to see themselves in relation to homelessness. So these students walk in, before they walk in, they're required to talk to a homeless person one-on-one -on -one, um, near the shelter, uh, they can, I asked them to be interviewed to, to interview homeless people at a place that's comfortable to them around the shelter. So I'm around, but it's a very private conversation between an uh, undergraduate student and a homeless person. And they're required to have this one hour, one hour more or less field-based semi-structure interview. They, I gave them classes about qualitative interviews, uh, the positioning of the interviewer and interviewee. I, I tell them about what is an organic flow of interaction. I tell them what does it mean when you ask questions like that as a student from the University of Oklahoma. Um, I, have, I happen to have a football player, uh, Aaron Rapelski, um, in my class. So the homeless person was a 
super football enthusiastic. <laughs> he cried immediately when he saw that this is the person who's going to interview him. <laughs> so this is a very interesting dynamics that's happening. And later, and, and of course, it changed me. I was so excited about all the data I have obtained. The homeless person got so excited that they actually start drawing pictures and gave it to our students and said, knowing that we want to do some book project about their experiences. So I bring these pictures home. I bring these narratives home. I was talking to my husband. And very quickly, we realized that some of the, th these narratives are not about facts. These narratives happen because an undergraduate student from a, the university is asking them about their life, how they see their world. So as we're, later during his discussion, um, we realized that one of the things that we, wa we don't want to do is we don't want to analyze these narratives in a way that, you know, how we frame it or define it or interpret it. Instead, we want to situate these narratives in our own cultural context. That what does it mean when these narratives emerge in our culture? So we start to talk about seeing hopelessness as a cultural phenomenon. We want to explore the cultural conditions that we live in that make these homeless experiences possible. And we want to look, reflect on the lack of sentimentality on this population and highlight the fragmentation of cultural consciousness and the desire to develop a universal context-free understanding of the marginalized. And my husband is gonna present the theoretical framework um, and with each of his um, main point, I will uh, use the pictures or the narratives that we gather from our data to sort of give you a sense of how these theoretical framework is backed up by real life experiences of the homeless. So, there you go. Uh, back in 1980, 1997, I published a, a edited book on homelessness. Uh, so I was interested in this topic for quite a while, and I was teaching at, uh, in Washington, D.C., and uh, I was in an apartment, uh, and I was looking down, and it was February, and it was extremely cold, and I saw a homeless man trying to hide between two buildings. Uh, and then in the class I was teaching, I had the highest ranking uh, person in the nursing uh, core of the United States military. She was taking my, my seminar and uh, I told her about this and I said, I, you know, this is, how, how can this happen? How can this happen? God damn it! How can this happen in Washington, D.C.? And she said, come with me tonight. And she took me and she handed out sandwiches in a park across from the White House filled with freezing men. And she said, many of these are veterans. I'm sorry. Anyway, Elaine did some amazing work with her students. The dean loved her. She is promoted to full professor in record time. That's wonderful. Uh, and her students were shocked. They, it, her, her class, she changed their lives. I wonder how many classes I've taught that nothing happened. Nothing. Uh, so I brought my giant brain with all my theories stuck in it, and I was thinking about uh, what one of my old German professors said to me. One time he said, in the 1920s and 30s in Germany, you grew a goatee and animal. <laughs> well, not at all of them. So I brought this theory in. Uh, I uh, have read a lot of Levinas. Levinas was a student of Edmund Husserl, and he, uh, they had a nice little debate going where Husserl said that uh, we constitute the other. And Levinas said, they constitute us. 
Uh, and about the time that Sartre developed the concept of gaze, which Foucault borrowed liberally, Levinas talked about the gaze of the other and how when we look at them, they're looking back at us. And at that moment, uh, we are exposed and we become vulnerable and we become uncomfortable. Uh, and so I was putting this together with Cooley and Mead and how the other constitutes me. And I have no idea how I really look to others. I think I do, uh, but I don't. I don't know how I sound when I record my own voice singing. It's horrible, but geez, when I'm in the shower, I'm great. I don't know what, what happens. The tape recorder ruins me. Uh, so I plugged in some Gramsci, and we talked about you know nonviolent resistance through Thoreau and, and Gandhi and all of that. But then something came back to haunt me, and that was Ernest Becker's work on uh, what is culture. Uh, and I've written many papers on culture, and I know all the definitions from Malinowski up through Beards and on and on and on. But Ernest Becker said that culture, one of the functions of culture, is to um, give its members a meaningful life, a way to uh, participate meaningfully. And so uh, looking at what these uh, homeless people were doing uh, and what they were saying to us, uh, I began to formulate this notion of anti-culture. Not subculture, not counterculture, but anti-culture. Uh, I think we have developed a culture. Last year I published a book with, with uh, three or four grad students on technology uh, and, and the extinction vortex. As you all know, we're in the midst of the greatest extinction of languages and cultures and flora and fauna at the same time, ever, in human history. There's something wrong. I think that's, uh, I could say that without going, stretching too far. Uh, and I think that our anti-culture, we, we, we have created structures of value and uh, exchange that are uh, destroying us. And one of the greatest delusions is the delusion of privilege. Mm -hmm. We have people living in you know, gated communities, nations behind gated military fronts, thinking they can somehow escape this. And nobody's going to escape this. We're all part of the system. It's a great delusion that I can buy my way, as Becker says, to immortality. Uh, it ain't going to happen. Uh, but unfortunately, that delusion is destroying a lot of things. Uh, it's driving and consuming. So what we did was we tried to get out of the way uh, and let the homeless use us as a conduit to the academic press uh, and to journalists. Uh, we wanted to show people that homelessness exists in rural America, in small town America. It's not just in Philadelphia or St. Louis or New York or you know Honolulu. It's uh, it's in rural America. We also wanted to present a few facts about how many Americans are homeless or uh, on the verge of homelessness. Many Americans go in and out of homelessness. It's it's episodic. And according to some statistics, half of all Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. They are one major illness away from homelessness. They are one layoff away from homelessness. And at the same time, they're totally deluded. You ask them and they will say, I'm middle class. And, but yet, they are under great stress and anxiety because they understand I'm right on the edge, uh, which affects everything, mental health, physical health. So we decided uh, to let her students just gather. We compiled it. I wrote some theory stuff, some fancy stuff of Levinas and you know, Ernest Becker and all this stuff. Uh, but then we took it to the University of Oklahoma Press. And initially, the editor was ecstatic. Uh, 
because it was about Oklahoma students, it was a new paradigm for teaching, uh, and it was about homelessness in the Norman community. And then they rejected it. And I was very curious. And we were told it wasn't academic enough. So our, our experiment to get out of the way, to give the, just to use our channel to let a subaltern speak was thwarted. Now, of course, we have all kinds of resources as academics, and we are finding other ways to get this stuff distributed, but it's, it's been kind of distorted because we have to play within these structural rules that we live in. Uh, so we're trying to force open some doors. Uh, but I'm, I'm really so proud of Elaine. I mean, she just took an undergraduate class and got an IRB and said, I'm going to let these undergraduates, I'm going to force them with the power of grades <laughs> to go find some homeless people. Yes, they're out there and talk to them and, and find out about them. And it worked astounding. Uh, the students were dramatically changed. Many of them came away realizing that homeless people are people. Uh, and they were fixed by the gays. Now some of the fancy stuff I get into, I get into, I look at Orsine's grid, Descartes, XY, you know, grid, and I think about space-time and a neo-Kantian sense and how homelessness are, are in my space-time, I'm in their space-time, but we're parallel universes. I'm driving to work, I'm on a schedule, and I see that guy standing on the street corner again. Uh, he's there. I see him. He's part of my world every day, part of my neighborhood. Uh, but somehow we're completely disconnected in our, in our cosmic structures. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Some of this is coming out through all other means, but uh, I was disappointed in that. It wasn't academic. That's it. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. These are some pictures they drew. So I'll just go through some of the pictures that they have here. Um, these are all pictures drawn by homeless people. Um, you know, some are colorful, others are lasso. Um, we in the paper we talked about how, um, in an effort to legitimize this suffering. Um, we have built up cultural ideologies of Darwinian economics, and these are reflected in the homeless people's narratives. So these are like, oh, I'm like, oh, look at what they all have and I don't have. Oh, look at normal people, oh. Yeah, I've been getting a little bit better. I mean, I already had been excluded most of my life, and now this is just one more step against me that makes me even more excluded, you know? I'm just sick of it. It's like, I'm not a real person. So in a way to mar marginalize these groups, the society justify cruelty um, to these people. In some of the studies about shelters, they talk about how shelter staff define what is appropriate behavior and you have to be appropriate in order to get assistance. In the end, in our manuscript, we talked about how, what is at risk is the question. What does, I mean, we, all of us can justify such uh, discrimination in a way to protect societal resources or to maintain orderly housing conditions or living conditions for the normal. Um, but these are homeless people making sense of this. He, he said, people have no idea. They think we're just a bunch of bums sitting around getting drunk. But it's hard, nowhere to sleep and no one wants to hire you. You can't have good hygiene and they don't want to be around that and they don't want to hire you. They think that we're stupid and lazy. This is a reflection of Darwinian economics. And they don't know um, wh what it is like until they have slept on this shit right here, pounds on concrete. Until they do that, they have no idea what it's like. The people are sleeping in their beds. They have no idea what it's like to wake up on concrete laps with a pair of shoes or a pillow if you have that. So these are very, very powerful 
um, narratives spoken face to face in private setting to an undergrad. And, and you know, at the end, I think this is a social change project more so for my undergraduate students mm -hmm. than for the homeless. Um, nevertheless, we argue that as we perpetuate such a culture that thinks it's okay to be cruel to its own members, what is really at stake is our humanity because the people we're mistreating is in fact our own selves. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.